was very successful and very informative for all of us. And at the time, we thought that this would be uh, the end of it. And by now, we know what will happen with Brexit. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. We're now in March 2019, and we're still all rather confused and uh, still ignorant about what will happen and our rights as European citizens here in the UK. So to that effect, we invited again Ms. Vicky Price to help us organize a second panel on Brexit. And we have an excellent panel of, for you tonight to give us the latest information and some maybe inside information on what is to be expected of Brexit in the next few weeks or months. Or years, maybe, yeah. <laughs> we'll know more after this event. Uh, now, having said that, uh, we need to remember that we are the Macedonian side of Great Britain, and since our foundation in 1989, our main purpose was to promote the history and culture of Macedonia in the UK and its real Greek identity. So with that in mind, we are going to uh, dedicate our next two events in, for, in, uh, to Macedonia. Our next event is on the 17th of May this year, and it will be a discussion on uh, the Prespes Agreement and what should we expect for that, uh, what are the consequences, and what changes it will bring to, uh, to Macedonia. Uh, following that, in October, on a day to be uh, decided, we're going to have an event about the coins of Alexander the Great and their influence in the ancient world and the importance for not just uh, Macedonia or Greece, but the whole uh, region where uh, Alexander uh, spread his empire. Uh, this event will be done in cooperation with uh, New College Oxford, and it promised to be very interesting. So we will send you details of both these events uh, as soon as we have them. Uh, if you're not a member of the society or you don't have we don't have our details. You are free to leave us your email address at the end of the lecture, and we are going to keep you up to date with all our activities. Uh, also, we do need your support. Uh, we do need to increase our members' base. Uh, our society depends on members being active and helping us. So if you want to register as a member, please feel free to ask us again after the lecture. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, we will charge you a very small annual fee for our administration expenses. And uh, it's very important for us to have a strong member base because if a society has a big base, it can do a lot more to help uh, Greece. So thank you again for coming here tonight. And uh, let me hand you now to Dr. Labrinaku, who's going to introduce our uh, speakers for tonight. Good evening. Uh, we are very honored to have four distinguished guests, and I will just um, introduce them to you. First of all, the chair of tonight's panel is Ms. Vicky Price. She's a leading economist and a board member at the Center of Economic and Business Research. At various stages in her career, she has held a number of economic positions in the banking and the oil sector. She was previously senior managing director at the FTI Consulting, Director General for Economics at the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, and Joint Hand of the UK Government Economic Service. She has also held a number of academic posts as visiting professor and fellow in various UK universities. She is the author of Greek Economics, a book discussing this crisis in the Eurozone and what a Greek exit from the Eurozone might mean. Dr. Dennis McSain was the UK's Minister for Europe in the Tony Blair government and a Labour Member of Parliament for 18 years. He first used the word Brexit uh, yes, in 2012 and has written two books on Brexit. He writes or speaks on European politics in the UK and continental media every day. Ms. Florence Meller is UK Director of Quality and Academic Services at ESCP Europe, London campus. Her area of specialization is academic standards and quality in higher education in the UK. She holds a master's in computer science from Birkbeck College and also teaches computer skills. Previously, she also worked as an auditor and a consultant in Italy and France. She is a French national living in the UK for 17 years and currently obtaining UK citizenship. 
The Brexit referendum led her to be involved in politics with the Liberal Democrats, and she is now a member of the Wandsworth Lib Dems Executive Committee, chair of Battersea Lib Dems Action Group, and an approved prospective parliamentary candidate. And Ms. Danae Kiriakopoulou is OMFIS Chief Economic and Head of Research, heading the organization's economic staff and providing intellectual leadership and direction to its economic research agenda. This covers areas of relevant to global investment institutions, ranging from monetary policy and financial regulation to reserve and asset management, including the development of new asset classes, such as green finance. She is a frequent speaker and contributor on these topics in international publication com publications, conferences, and the media. Previously, she was managing economist at the Center for Economic and Business Research. She has also served as an economic advisor to the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and has worked at the Bank of Greece. So, Ms. Vicky Price to uh, chair this to tonight's event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this introduction. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, it's great to be back here, but of course it's not great that we don't know what's happening, or rather we don't know what's going to happen, and we may have to come back again, uh, which would be great for, for all of us, I'm sure. So, um, uh, mainly for those, of course, who don't want to leave the EU. Um, it is a very timely event, um, because of course there have been all these votes this week. Uh, I know that a number of... Uh, Greeks have been trying to understand what's happening. Uh, I've been speaking to my family. I've done the odd uh, radio interview. Uh, well, I can tell you they're probably uh, even more confused than, than uh, they were before um, because the events of this week have been quite extraordinary. Uh, and who best to start us off but the ex-Minister um, for Europe, Dennis McShane, so what we'll do is I'll go straight to, to Dennis. As you will notice, uh, this is an all-women panel, um, but we made an exception for Dennis, and I hope he doesn't mind that. Um, so Dennis, if you can start, and then uh, I will move to, um, I think it's going to be the Nye afterwards, and then Florence at the end, and then we'll come back with some comments. Uh, I'll come back with some comments, and then we will open it up to questions. So Dennis, over to you. Thank you very much, Vicky. It's lovely to be at the Hellenic Centre and always lovely to be with the great friends of the Macedonian society. Now, Brexit is like a giant tube of superglue that every day is squeezed into the machinery of government, into politics, into business, and it's gumming everything up into a giant Gordian knot. But unfortunately, uh, Theresa is neither Alexander nor great. Uh, and Jeremy Corbyn's a bit old to all, oh, hold up a sword and cut the Gordian knot. So this is our problem. We have absolutely no leadership on available to sort this disaster out for us. There's no Winston Churchill, no Roosevelt, no. We've got Boris Johnson somewhere, so we just have to make do with him. But first, a very important public sector announcement, service announcement, dear friends. Britain has to import all its soft tissue paper. We don't really have a proper paper industry in this country. The soft tissue paper is used in a very important commodity called toilet paper. And there is only one day's stock of toilet paper in Britain. So if Brexit really does cut uh, communication in the commercial sense, lorry sense, with Europe, please just be prepared. But everything you do, a contract side for insurance policy, for a banking, for an investment policy, could be worthless overnight because we will have left the protection of the common law which governs our relations with all our 27 neighboring uh, European Union countries uh, and their relations with us. This is how serious it, it, it is. Um, I'm trying to get from Paris back to London next week. There are no trains from Paris to London before Tuesday. 
because there's a small strike of the customs control people in, in, in Paris. But that multiplied a hundredfold. Lidl, for example, the supermarket chain, has 1,300 lorries that arrive every day in Dover from its different depots in Europe for what's called just-in-time delivery. If those have to be checked even for one minute each, that is a queue going back 50 kilometers very quickly. So this is how serious it can be. I'll talk briefly on politics in the UK, politics in Europe, and what might happen next. The most important thing to understand is there are no negotiations with Europe, with the European Union, the 27, Michel Barnier. There is a very simple withdrawal agreement. That's the only legal instrument, which covers just three uh, pillars. Number one, the money we owe, not really any discussion, debate over that. It'd be like a divorce. You may not like it, but you go and see lawyers and they tell you how much to pay and you pay it. Number two, treatment of European Union citizens living in the UK and British citizens living on the, in, in the European Union countries. So it was a deeply flawed referendum. We now know there are serious police investigations going into the right-wing gentleman who took money from uh, Vladimir Putin, took money from the United States, because Mr. Putin's key policy objective is to break up the European Union. He was interfering in Greece, as you all know very, very well, recently over the Macedonia question. I'm not getting into that, but his object, he, didn't go, he doesn't give a damn about Macedonia, in, in the sense we would talk about it here. His only thing was to try and trip up the EU to make Europe look stupid, incompetent, unable ever to reach any agreement. He's doing the same thing in other countries as we speak. And he was heavily involved in that Brexit uh, decision. So I don't think there'll be a decision from uh, Europe, uh, from, from the House of Commons. So what then are the politics of Europe? Well, frankly, Europe is aghast at Brexit. Though the paradox is that Brexit actually has been very, very good news for European Union and European Union unity, not in some angelic, religious sense, but every single party that in 2016 had a policy to leave the, the European Union, a policy to have a referendum on the European Union, or a policy to quit the Euro, or you might call it the sort of Varoufakis uh, concept of Europe, uh, has now dropped that policy. That Marie Le Pen's dropped it. The uh, alternative for Deutschland has dropped it. Mr. Salvini, the strong man in Italy, was always calling for referendums to get out of the EU and out of the Euro. He's dropped that. The last one was the Swedish Left Party. It used to be the old Stalinist Communist Party. Even they want to stay in Europe. And when Communist Stalinists want to stay in Europe, something big has happened. And that's thanks to Brexit. Uh, that nobody wants Brexit to happen. They'd much rather Mrs May found a compromise. They'd much rather we changed our mind. I mean, the Irish changed their mind in a second referendum. The Danes changed their mind on leaving Europe and repudiating the treaty in a second referendum. The Swiss voted to abolish freedom of movement in 2014 in a referendum and then changed their minds, gave it to their parliament, and the parliament found, Swiss parliament found ways of reorganizing the labor market to sort of de-dramatize that. We could do that. It's a te technical issue, perhaps in questions and answers. So nobody wants Britain to lose. It is lose, lose, lose. There are no winners out of Brexit at all. Uh, it'll be very serious for Ireland, because Ireland really is interconnected entirely with the British or mainland economy. Very bad news for France, for all the coastal European states that do direct trade uh, with uh, Britain. Very bad news potentially for the tourist industry, uh, for that giant part of the industry in many countries which depends on British people 
visiting, on, not just on holidays, but staying for six months, maybe staying permanently, setting up small businesses. I mean, I've long argued, I'm not going to get into Greek politics, that it should, could be, parts of Greece could become, to northern Europe, what Florida is, say, to the United States, where people from the colder northern Europe come down for the friendly Greek weather, the nice food, the sea, uh, and, and the great warmth of Greek hospitality. Uh, there are planning and other things that maybe stop this happening, but I think still there's a huge potential for that development. So all of those difficulties are bad. We're sending a message out to Japanese investors, American investors. You come and set up in Britain, you may have problems selling your product to Europe. Fine, you might think, well, that will allow people to go to other countries, but maybe the Japanese and the other investors won't come at all. Uh, already one trillion pounds. I don't even know how many zeros one trillion has in it. It's, I think, 1,000 billion. It's, it's, it's a bit more than my savings. Uh, one trillion euros, uh, pounds, have left the City of London to be reinvested in European capitals to have full access to the uh, European uh, single market. And the city provides 13% of all taxes in Britain, and those taxes are what pay for roads and schools and the NHS and all the things that we want to, uh, by way of public service. So that's under threat. So everybody's very concerned. Uh, small, small divisions, I think, but not big ones between the different European leaders. I can sort of sketch through uh, all of the differences at the moment. Europe itself, thanks to the Trump trade war, the slowdown of the Chinese economy, is now going through a much slower growth period. Not as bad economically as Britain, but Britain, if you add Brexit Britain to the reduced growth and the trade tensions uh, around the world and the drop in Chinese consumption, then we're looking at a very tricky economic period ahead of us. So the Europeans will, I don't like the term Europeans, I mean there are 27 sovereign governments. Uh, it's Mr. Macron, it's, it's Mrs. Merkel, it's Mr. Sanchez in Spain, it's Mr. Rutter in Denmark, uh, Mr. Tsipras, for the time being, in, in Greece. Uh, uh, and they will take a collective decision next week on what to do. I think probably they'll offer some kind of an extension. But a very short one, Mr. Juncker said it could go until the 23rd of May. That's a six-week extension. Well, friends, six weeks ago, well, what was that, the beginning of February, and Britain was unable to take a decision on Brexit then. Our MPs know what they don't want. They don't want no deal. Some of them don't want no Europe, don't want Europe. But they don't know what they do want. And there's no leadership either from Mr. Corbyn or Mrs. May, no Alexander to cut that Gordian uh, knot. So the Europeans as a whole are, are helpless. There's not a concession they can make. There's not a final deal at 5 to 12 on the last day like in a business deal or in many other negotiations, no. Uh, I mean, Europe is what the Germans call eine Rechtsgemeinde, a community of laws. And you can't simply say to a country, you can ignore the laws you don't want. I mean, I bet you there are a lot of people in Greece who love to have ignored European obligations, but the Greeks decided in referendums, I mean, I think the handling of it was awful from Brussels, but nonetheless, I think Greece was right to say, no, we're not going to go back to the drachma, no, we're not going to quit the European Union, despite the immense pain and difficulty. You know, I saw it with my, my own eyes, and I hope soon, bit by bit, Greece will come out of the last dreadful, one of the worst 10 years in, in Greek history, other than in times of absolute uh, conflict. And so we are facing a very difficult time across the whole of Europe. Um, Brexit doesn't help. I just hope that Mrs. May will wake up one morning uh, and decide that she is prepared to compromise and we can then move at least to consider a new referendum, uh, to consider negotiating with Europe in a way that does the minimal economic, social, cultural damage to keep uh, free flow of people, free flow of goods, free flow of money, services between the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe. But it's touch and go, my friends. At times, I think it's like July, August 1914. Nobody wanted the First World War to start, but everybody was taking decisions 
in their own little closed tent, as it were, not try to talk to anybody else in other tents. Uh, and in the end, war happened. In the 1930s, many politicians in Britain appeased Hitler, said he was a good guy, there wasn't any threat of war, he wasn't a problem. We're in one of those phases now where MPs cannot rise above their own particular narrow sectional and sectoral and sectarian interests and see the wider picture. Now, of course, that never happens in Greece or any other country in Europe. And the trouble is, it is very acute now, and I am very, very uncertain. There is going to be a lot more paid uncertainty and difficulty uh, in, in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. But, uh, the only, uh, so I presume, positive note is for those um, manufacturers who produce toilet paper, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, to sell to the UK. Uh, it's quite interesting, actually. I was speaking to my sister yesterday, as I said. One speaks to the Greeks a lot, who are, are worried about what happens to their relatives here and whether their daughters can still stay here for the future and what will happen if they want to come here and study and so on. Uh, and she did say, is it true you're running out of Lural? And I said, where did you read that? So obviously it's made it into the Greek n newspapers and, and the news. So um, I don't quite know how it all started. Um, but I don't think there has been much stockpiling of Lural. In fact, uh, you can still buy it quite easily. So um, I will now turn to, to the Nai to tell us a little bit about uh, her view of how the Europeans are looking at this uh, and also a little bit about the financial sector. Thank you, Vicky, and thank you, Dennis, also for these remarks. To give also my two cents on the short-term politics, I think I agree we'll have a quite a period of uncertainty and the, the core issue is that there is no unity around what the UK wants, there is no unity on what Parliament wants, what the public wants and I think that's making the solution very difficult but I don't think a hard Brexit or a no deal situation is a likely scenario, I think it's a, still a very unlikely scenario. Um, out of the scenarios that we're seeing all carry low probabilities but I think uh, no deal for the reasons also that uh, Dennis outlined that is in no one's interest, it's a lose-lose situation, is not something that we are likely to see but it could be an accident um, again as we heard. I think an extension is the most likely thing we will see now, for how long that will be, there is legal issues around this as well, because there's the European Parliament elections taking place in May. Currently, there are no provisions for UK um, members of the European Parliament to be elected in those elections, so that would need to be changed if we saw an extension beyond July, which is when the next uh, European Parliament take their seats. Uh, but beyond the short-term issues, I'd like to talk mainly about um, three things, and one is the opportunity cost of Brexit that we've seen in the UK. Dennis described it as a super glue that has taken over the political life, uh, the business life, the economy. And I think that's re really the cost of Brexit, that we have parliament, business, everyone worrying about this one issue, which is very important, but at the same time, a lot of the other policies that the UK still needs to keep up with and to focus on, um, like education, infrastructure, um, uh, climate, and so on, are being uh, put down on the list because everyone is focusing their attention on Brexit. And to me, that is a very worrying thing when you look at the UK going forward and how much energy and attention has been paid on, the, on this and how moving forward we, we move away from that and rebuilding unity around other policies as well. Um, the, th the second issue is on future relations between the, the UK and European countries. And yes, it's true that not a lot is being discussed at the moment. There is no legal basis to start talking about future relations until the exit um, situation is clarified. But on the sides, a lot of the embassies, for example, the British embassies around Europe are doing work to see how do we move from a relationship that has so far been handled through Brussels to one that is more bi of a more bilateral nature. The organization I work for, OMFIF, uh, stands for the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, which um, uh, Vic, where Vicky is also one of our advisors in the Advisors Network. We've been doing a lot of work with the British embassies around 
uh, Europe in terms of what will be the priorities that the UK and say Germany or France or Spain, Italy can still work together on and how do we move into a more bilateral nature of the relationship. So this is still very much that, that even those who support Brexit want to continue having strong relations with Europe uh, on a different nature. And these take place on issues such as the future of work, artificial intelligence, how do we move into supporting climate um, adjustment, um, issues of trade and supply chains as well. So there is some work being done in that area, but of course it's something that is not the priority at the moment. Um, and then I wanted to talk also about the future of the EU without the UK. Um, so we heard from Dennis that Brexit has united the EU in some ways, and this is not something that was really expected. There was a fear when we saw the referendum in the UK that other countries would uh, follow that lead, that it could be a domino effect. There were people that really thought that could be the case. Uh, but we haven't seen that. We've seen the opposite, really. And a lot of the parties that uh, previously supported um, the, their own exit from the EU in some way or a, a more de detachment from the EU have now dropped those, those policies. And it's the one issue that um, the EU 27, when they get around the table, they, they all agree on. And it's almost a feel-good factor because when there's so many issues that they've disagreed on in the past, and they have their um, uh, these heated conversations. Suddenly, there is this one thing that everyone agrees on, and, and they feel good about it. Um, but it's um, I don't see the EU changing this in the coming weeks and months as the UK puts more pressure for them to drop some of the um, concessions that they want. I think they've maintained the unity so far, and that will continue. But it will also affect the EU in terms of the UK not longer being part of the conversations and driving the discussions, and also the expertise and uh, support and resources that the UK has offered to the EU. And I think, again, that's something that is not being talked enough uh, beyond the day-to-day the -day negotiations that are going on between the UK and the EU. So in areas in the financial sector where I specialize, for example, one of the things that the UK was driving very much was how do we deepen uh, integration of capital markets across Europe, and uh, that's something that one may say will still continue without the UK, but the UK's absence is forcing countries that were supporting these kind of policies to rise more and to express their opinions more strongly because the UK is now leaving this vacuum that will have to be filled somehow. There is um, some expectation that countries such as Germany and France will now be driving more of the agenda within Europe, um, with the UK being the other big country that was previously very active. In some ways, the UK, under, for example, George Osborne's chancellorship, was not really driving that. It was more about how do we get the best uh, for the city of London. So from that perspective, perhaps there won't be that much of a change. Um, but all these reforms uh, that focus more on the euro area will be more important because the euro area countries will now form a much bigger majority of the European Union as a whole and uh, Poland will perhaps be the only non-euro country that is of, sig of significant size um, and at the moment it also has tensions with the EU over other issues in terms of um, social values and so on. So I think that's quite important in terms of how Europe moves forward. There are plans for further integration of the euro area, of reforming the monetary union in terms of, for example, building uh, uh, some sort of common budget or some uh, common finance minister in terms of strengthening the defenses uh, for coping with economic crisis. Uh, lessons from the Greek crisis were very important there. How do we make the institutions uh, more ready to cope with such uh, situations. And there is uh, certainly more risk of crisis. I think we heard earlier about the growth rates being uh, lower. Um, I think when we look at, as an economist, looking at headline growth, yes, the global economy is moving into a phase where growth will, will be more moderate now than what we've seen in the past few years. But that in many ways is natural because it's, it, it grew very fast, especially the euro area. Uh, economy in the past, and it's, it's normal that it's now uh, getting a bit slower. I think that is not so much the key question, it's more about the downside risks and how these have increased. So one of them is, of course, the no-deal Brexit that is a small probability but would, could still happen, and the other is, of course, Italy, uh, which is another crisis that the euro area may have to cope 
with soon, and we will see after the European Parliament elections which direction the, the government goes and how its relationship with the EU changes as well, because for now that is something that has been put off the table. The European Union itself does not really want to have a, uh, tensions with Italy right before the European elections, because that could also embolden Eurosceptic uh, Euro parties, but it's something that we could see after the summer. And I think also the absence of, of UK uh, MEPs from the European Parliament will also be important. The uh, UK's um, main uh, right-wing party, the Tory party, was not sitting with the main uh, conservative party of the European Parliament. Um, that was a decision under David Cameron to, to join the, the more far right. So I think that will also change the arithmetic of the Parliament. And curiously enough, because of the UK leaving, we may see a more uh, less of a shift to the right from the European Parliament in the elections than we would have seen otherwise. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, of course, also you won't have UKIP, um, which which was a, a very substantial force in the referendum campaign. And of course, the worry, one of the reasons why we had the referendum campaign and the referendum itself is because UKIP had come first, if I remember correctly, in the, in the last European uh, Parliament elections that we had. And that really frightened um, David Cameron, who thought perhaps we can sort that out once and for all <laughs> by, by having the referendum, which didn't quite happen somehow. Um, okay, now we'll move to Florence, and then we'll come back to some of these issues uh, that uh, you two have raised and uh, what Florence is going to say at the end of Florence's presentation too. Thank you. Uh, Shall I move this so at least you yeah. Thank you very much, Dennis and Danae, for those words. And thank you, Vicky, of course, for chairing this session. Thank you for the Macedonian Society to host this beautiful event and the Hellenic Center. Um, so I'm a French person living in the UK for 18 years, and I work in higher education, which is my area of expertise. And also I'm in politics. So the f whole situation today is a heartbreak, nothing but a heartbreak. And it's a fool's game, nothing but a fool's game. So now it would be time to take a step back and try to understand why we fell into and we got trapped into that fool's game. So of course this leads to questions on how democracy works. And of course it's been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. Um, we need to think about electoral systems and also we need to think about politics because politics has to do with emotions. Um, human beings are driven by their emotions and sometimes they get overwhelmed um, by their emotions and this is what we see very often when there's a vote. Um, so. These emotions have led now to a bipolarization of society, which is very re regrettable, um, because we know when we look um, in history that when society has been bipolarized politically, this has led to conflicts. We've seen that in Europe in the 30s with fascism and communism, of course, and that led to World War II. And after World War II, there was the shock between the USSR and the US, and that led to the Cold War, which lasted until 1991, with devastating consequences all over the world. So democracy may lead to bipolarization, and bipolarization leads to conflict. And this is all very negative, and this is the situation we're in. So, of course, we're surrounded by negativity at the moment when we turn on the radio or TV. But I would like now to concentrate and focus on all the positive aspects and all the nice things that there are in the UK and just talk about my experiences as a French woman uh, moving in London in 2001 and all the opportunities I had here which are extraordinary. So when I moved in here, um, I thought it would be a good idea to go back to university, to requalify, and of course, upgrade my CV. 
So I was given the first opportunity that changed my life, and it was to do a conversion master's degree. That concept of conversion master's degrees doesn't exist anywhere else. I had a business studies background, undergraduate studies, and I was given the possibility to study computer science and get a master's of science in computer science. And this you can only do in the UK. Okay, so this changed my life because thanks to that master's degree, I found a job here in London that was offered to me by an Italian man, because London is so international that, of course, an Italian man would give me a job in London, in a French institution. And that only happens in London, of course. An Italian man gives me a job in London within a French institution. Um, and that was another extraordinary opportunity. Um, I started at a very low level as an academic coordinator, but within two days, I became director of studies. <laughs> this only happens in this country. I mean, it would have never, ever happened to me in Paris. Never. So, of course, I had to work for this. It's, it wasn't easy at all. It was very challenging. Uh, a lot of problem solving and decision making. But it happened to me here. And this is why I love this country and this is why I want to stay. And this is why I'm applying for UK citizenship. Although many French people are saying, oh no, never. <laughs> because of course, England is still the enemy for some people. Um, and then another extraordinary opportunity, Brexit. <laughs> It's another opportunity, with some respect, um, because when um, the referendum campaign started, I decided to get involved. Of course, I've lived in Italy, I've lived in Paris, I've lived in the UK. For me, anything European is very sensitive and very close to my heart. Again, emotions. So um, I decided to get involved and to campaign. So I started to gain campaigning experience, political campaigning. And then after the vote, I decided to take membership with the Lib Dems because it was the only party with a clear view on Europe. So I started to campaign with the Lib Dems and they offered me to become a candidate. So honestly, as a French person, being a candidate in the local elections in the UK is extraordinary. Would it happen in France? I don't think so, that you would allow an English person, of course you can allow, but would you ask an English person to stand in the local elections in France? I doubt. Honestly, I doubt. So I was given that opportunity of being a candidate, of campaigning, Okay, wasn't elected, but I got 365 votes, which is a good result. <laughs> I was quite proud of this, and it was a very good experience as well. And after that, um, of course, the Lib Dems are always looking for women, um, taking more responsibilities. In the nicest okay. possible way. <laughs> yes, in the nicest possible way. Right. <laughs> Um, and I was offered the possibility to take the assessment to become prospective parliamentary candidate, PPC. Although I'm French, they allowed me to take that assessment, which is an exam, of course, it's, um, you need to study it. it, it's not that simple. But now I'm a French person and I'm prospective parliamentary candidate. And this is extraordinary, isn't it? So all of those opportunities were made possible here, and I truly think that they would have never been possible in any other EU country. So also, I wanted to say that the UK have also invented very good things, like uh, the four freedoms, the freedom of movement, goods, capital, services, and labor. This was a British idea, and we should not forget this. And also the European Court of Human Rights was also a British idea. 
uh, first proposed by Winston Churchill and drafted by British lawyers. We are in a very unfortunate situation, but of course I'm optimistic. And I think that there are good reasons why this situation will soon come to an end and that Britain will be great again. My goodness. So we're finishing on a positive note? Yes. Very good. That is quite surprising. That's fantastic. Uh, but actually, I want to add something to what you said about the UK. This is an interesting thing that it, it is absolutely true that it was the UK that pushed a lot for the single market. And I remember when I was at KPMG, we, we in fact wrote up everything that there was to be gained from the single market on behalf of the government, which then went to all the businesses to understand what it is that they could now do. Because, of course, what it does is it takes away any barriers, uh, both in terms of goods and also services. The non-tariff uh, barriers, very important. You talked about conversion from one degree to another. Of course, they had to already accept your degree, your first degree. So qualifications, people can move easily, and so on and so forth. Um, but in this freedom of movement, there was no obligation for any of the countries to uh, accept foreigners in the civil service, or in the public sector more generally, but particularly in the civil service. So, as you were saying, it is very unlikely you're going to be going to uh, a, a government department in France and find lots of Brits or Italians or Greeks working there. You go to any department in the UK and it's full of Europeans, but also Indians, Chinese and so on. And when I worked for the government, uh, recruiting economists, they, the, the majority of the people who were recruiting were not the UK, because the UK had, had, were not, e, not UK-born uh, uh, people with a British passport, um, because the UK had decided not to, to follow what the others were doing, but to have a special uh, change in the, in the rules and in its law, which opened the door in the civil service and the public sector to everyone. everyone. And I think, Dennis, you may have been involved in in getting that accepted. Um, so it is an extraordinary thing that you're absolutely right, that we have been the, the most open in this respect. We were the first to, to open up to some of the Eastern European countries. We were the ones who pushed for the Eastern European countries to be accepted in the EU. Uh, and now, somehow or other, we, we seem to want to close that down. And uh, I'd like to share your optimism that in the end, the free spirit, or whatever it is, um, will prevail. But uh, we'll see what the, the audience think about that too. So anyway, thank you very much for those for those comments. I think I, before I open it up uh, for questions, I do have to, to uh, ask a couple of things myself. Because uh, I've been here for a very long time. Um, but I have been absolutely frustrated this week. I thought uh, there was a vote to um, kill the no deal. I was listening to uh, the one o'clock news today, uh, and it was all about Ireland, Northern Ireland, and it was all about what would happen if there is a no deal. Uh, so I don't quite understand how Parliament here works, um, Well, maybe it's uh, simpler in, in the UK. So, so there's that. Then we talk about an extension. So everyone has been saying, Brexit is dead, there's now going to be an extension. You read what, in fact, has been decided. And this is that, the, that Theresa May, if she gets a deal through for the third time, will, will then get, will go to the, the European Council meeting, which is happening a few days later, and will ask for an extension of three months, two months, three months, whatever, uh, in order to get all the, the sort of legislation through that she absolutely needs to get through and to get the treaty signed with the Europeans, the, the final uh, withdrawal deal. Um, but if she doesn't get it, there's, we haven't got a clue what she will do. Uh, sh there's a talk of having a longer extension, um, maybe a few years, going back and asking that, which she's using now to frighten people to vote for her deal again. Uh, but the no deal thing is still there. So, so I don't understand what we voted for. And, and as I was saying, I mean, imagine everyone abroad looking at all this and saying, this is a farce. Uh, this is a fiasco. Democracy, yes, fantastically good thing. but. I personally don't understand the rules any longer, despite the fact that I worked for the government for quite some time. So, Dennis, can you explain? Well, it, it's actually an existential constitutional battle. Don't underestimate it. On one side, the democracy of 
Parliament, the way we've been governed since the end of the 17th century after a brutal civil war. Uh, we chopped off a king's head to establish the supremacy of parliament. And that has guided us, and I, uh, not always that brilliantly, but effectively over the last 300 years. Now we have the democracy of the plebiscite, the referendum. It's not in the constitution. It can't be in the constitution because we don't have a constitution. Uh, so somebody said David Cameron dreamt this up in 2013, before actually UKIP did well in the European Parliament election, and he just imposed it on Britain. Well, to be fair, he won an election in 2015, so he had that mandate. Uh, it was said of the British Prime Minister Lord North in the 18th century, he lost America. It will say in 200 years' time in the history books that David Cameron lost Europe. Uh, so, but we don't know how to bring the, these two together. Because Mrs May is defeated and defeated in the Commons. She says, I don't care. I represent the democracy of the plebiscite, of the referendum. I stand on the 37% of the British total electorate that voted for Brexit. Nobody knows how to, to bring these two democracies together. In other countries like Switzerland, I mean, they have referendums uh, every week and, and twice on, on, on Sundays. Uh, and they're used to it. Other countries will have in their constitution, for example, most countries have a threshold. You must get 40% of all eligible voters to agree to a change. In Hungary, it's 50%. In some countries, it's two-thirds. In Germany and in America, the referendum to decide treaties or big constitutional changes is simply illegal. I mean, I, I, it's not a question of this country is better than that country, but we suddenly introduced this dramatic new concept of the populist plebiscite, uh, and we haven't known how to work our way out of it. So the MPs themselves feel, and many of them are my friends, they're pro-European, but they say, Dennis, I go back to my constituency and people say, we voted to leave, why haven't we left? And it's quite hard to turn around and say, because you voted to leave on the basis of the most outrageous campaigns of lies ever in British history. It was a, uh, an opera of lies, of dishonesty, of cheats, of untruths, of monstrous xenophobia, of hate against Europeans, of crawling to Putin. It makes Donald Trump look like a Swedish social democrat, that campaign. But no, we're not allowed to challenge the campaign. The people have spoken. Um, and Mrs May won't compromise. I mean, she's an only child, the daughter of a vicar, um, didn't have any brothers or sisters, didn't have any children. I mean, that happens to, sorry, that's not directly relevant, but in a sense, you know, it's in a family that you're, you're told, for God's sake, will you shut up? You are so boring. No, I'm going to watch television tonight. Go away and sit in your room and just shut your face. I'm talking about my brothers. Um, I didn't have any sisters. It would have been far worse, I reckon. Uh, but Mrs May never had that. She's never actually had people telling her, you're being stupid, you're an idiot, you're a fool, which is what happens in families. Um, the children tell you all the time, you know, what a useless piece of pathetic human non-existence you are, at least my four children do. Mrs May doesn't have that. Uh, so she doesn't know how to compromise. Um, it would be quite easy to have a compromise, I'd say, to stay in the customs union. The Labour Party would support that. The Scottish Nationalists, the Liberal Democrats would. I think Florence is, is a parliamentary candidate. And it, it, it would, it would de-crisis the whole thing. Or, as I said, to leave the European econ Union economically, like the Norwegians do. Or to accept freedom of movement like the Swiss do. Could, could I just ask you one, so, one thing before... Uh, I'm moving to, to also ask Danai and uh, after I want something as well. Uh, how is it possible to be bringing back to Parliament 
something that has already been voted down twice, you bring it back again in exactly the same form. I mean, we've already had it in exactly the same form. Um, and there was a lot of talk today on the radio um, about uh, the speaker actually disallowing it possibly, although it's going to be very, very hard to do politically. Um, and yet, here we are, we're bringing something that has already been voted down twice without, whereas the referendum, you've got to absolutely abide by it. We can't have another vote. But, but how can procedurally, since you were in Parliament for quite a long time, uh, be allowed to, to just bore people to tears by bringing this back again, hoping that you're finally going to be able to get it, get it through by, by cajoling and also threatening, threatening a lot of, so bribing. I mean, the DUP is somewhere, uh, you know, in, in Downing Street talking to Theresa May. Apparently they're having constructive discussions. We all read from the outside as just bribing them a little bit more, but I hope this isn't recorded um, and goes out uh, on, on air. But that, um, so, so how can you do that, Dennis? Can you just explain? Is this, is this normal? Or are we going through extraordinary times here? Well, the DUP are a pure product of the democracy of Parliament in the sense that they only, in 2015, they got 25% of the vote of the Northern Irish people. Have you heard in the last two years any other Northern Irish voice on the BBC, on the radio program, on the other TV stations, speaking for the 75% of Northern Ireland who did not vote DUP. The Nationalists, the Catholics, the more moderate Unionists. I mean, they're a very odd party. They claim to want to speak for the whole of the United Kingdom, except they deny the right of gays in Northern Ireland to have the same law as the United Kingdom. They deny the women of Northern Ireland the same rights uh, as the people in uh, the women in the United uh, Kingdom, but they give the Prime Minister her majority. And in a parliamentary system, the people, and you, know, God, you must know it plenty from Greece, the minority parties can cause, you know, get their own way and have a, uh, an excessive amount of uh, influence. But again, because, Vicky, to go back to your question, there's no constitutional rules. The only constitutional rule is that the parliament is supreme. It can make any laws it wants. It cannot bind a success. In other words, one parliament cannot say the next parliament will do this or that. Uh, and so uh, Mrs May is able to bring back her... Uh, deal again and again. But you I said the Parliament is supreme rather than government, and yet, as I, as I asked already, see, since the Parliament has already voted against the no deal, somehow or other it's not binding, and it hardly matters it voted for a no deal. That's really the thing that puzzles lots of people who look at well, it from well, the no, outside. Well the, well, the difference is that nobody in Parliament can stand up and say, we don't want uh, Mrs May's deal, I now have a majority for staying in the customs union. I now have a majority for a new referendum. That was defeated overwhelmingly. Only 85 members of parliament out of 650 voting for a new referendum uh, uh, a couple of days back. Uh, so that's the problem. The government still represents the decision of Parliament of, how, of who should run the country, and there's absolutely no majority. People are trying to put together coalitions to support, say, a Norway solution, which is why an extension always pleases. When in doubt, you know, kick the can down the road. We're not going to start First World War this August. We want another extension for at least a month while we think about it a bit more. <laughs> and perhaps some brilliant minds will come uh, together. I don't care. Let's have another extension after that. And then another extension. And then another extension. And, you know, 20 years it's of fine. extensions and we'll, be, we'll, we'll still be in the European Union. Great. I think that would be a fantastic idea. Um, now, now the night, uh, of course, the withdrawal agreement doesn't cover services. And we have another two years after that, at least. Uh, the transition itself might become longer and longer and longer. So if the withdrawal deal goes through, we then have a two-year transition period where nothing changes, but during which we're negotiating everything. But so far, the only interest that seems to be there is to do something about goods rather than services. And here we are, the whole of the financial sector 
screaming a little bit. They're very worried about what will happen. And the service sector, which accounts for 80% of the economy, um, hardly covered um, by, by what we've got. So what, what, you know, clearly the, the French and others are trying to take away various things, but, but what will be the, the, the issues that you think we all need to be watching ahead? Yes, I'll, I'll talk about that, but I also want to make some comments on, on sure. what um, Dennis was saying on the uh, legitimacy and democracy um, of referendum and versus parliament as well. But on services and goods, it's true that the goods sector has attracted most of the attention. They have been the most vocal groups, and we keep hearing about the car trade, for example. But financial services, which is really the main issue for the economy, has not been given enough attention, and you see a lot of our members who are private sector institutions from the asset management industry, the insurance industry, the banking industry, are making preparations for a no-deal Brexit, because they have to, because when you're in business and there is uncertainty, that's what you do, and increasingly, over the past few months, they've been moving uh, more and more jobs to Europe. And it's these kind of movements are also irreversible in many cases. Even if we get more and more extensions, that's not good enough for business. You're not going to move back because you have another month and then another month and then another month. Sure. And, and, even, and as De Danny said, it makes it more likely that in the end we will stay in the EU if that keeps happening because you, you referenced earlier about the demographics as well and how demographic groups voted in the referendum and every day a Brexiteer sort of passes away and a <laughs> remainer is born. It's, that is the, the reality of the demographic uh, views on Brexit. So if we keep extending it, it's more likely that we'll stay in. Sorry, did I? You just say every baby at this age of three months is going, remain, remain, <laughs> remain. I love the idea. I love the idea. Um, but for business, these kind of jobs are not going to move back. It's something we saw um, also in the case of Spain, where there was the uncertainty around Catalonia. And a lot of uh, businesses move their headquarters to Madrid. Now the Catalonia referendum is no longer an issue, but they're not moving those back to Catalonia. I think it will be very difficult to reverse some of these changes and a lot of um, cities around Europe are also building their um, capacity to host more and more in terms of uh, commercial properties, for example, that can host people in terms of um, building and attracting international schools, for example, so that bankers can find it easier to, to live in a city like Frankfurt, for example. Um, there is uh, more um, life and uh, restaurants and so on being uh, built and, and uh, founded in those cities to make, to, to welcome uh, the industries that will move out of London. There is active campaigning going on in some cases, like with uh, Paris, in terms of attracting those industries. So I think that is a real risk that even if in the end we see a softer kind of Brexit or even no Brexit, uh, how do we recover from that? I think that will be a difficult discussion for the future. Um, on the issue of the referendum, I think it, this is a very important issue, and I sympathize with a lot of the things that Dennis said about how the campaign in this case was uh, did not fulfill perhaps all of the criteria of democracy. There was uh, foreign intervention in some cases. There were lies. Um, but as, as uh, Florence said, um, democracy is still the best uh, option we have, and if we start challenging outcomes in a country like the UK where, after all, you do have free press in relative terms compared to the rest of the world, then what is our hope for other countries uh, where a lot of these conditions of an educated, relatively educated population, free press and so on, are not fulfilled, then we may as well um, uh, finish the conversation of that altogether. I think that the bigger issue is on referendum versus parliament is why did we turn to a referendum and it wasn't because this was a decision that really needed to be made by the people. It was because uh, parliament wanted to use it or, or the David Cameron's government wanted to use it as an excuse for not uh, owning up to what was essentially an issue that was not about Europe. All these um, uh, voters that um, voted for Brexit, it was because of uh, having been left behind by the opening up to competition, having been left behind because there was no retraining and not support of the industries that were dying because of globalization. And in many cases, it didn't have to do anything with Europe, and Europe was always a very convenient scapegoat for uh, successive uh, British governments to always point the finger to. And I think that is um, also something that will definitely be very important for the future as well, because we haven't really talked about would Europe welcome the UK back if the UK changed its mind? And that's something where there is a lot of divisions in Europe. I know 
Dennis, you're also in Brussels quite a lot, and you see various groups there. There are some countries that say, yes, absolutely, we prioritize the trade, uh, car um, uh, manufacturers in Germany and so on. We want to keep a closer relation with the UK. There are others who think of the UK as the bad apple, that they don't want the UK back in, because that may, having, U having UKIP uh, members of the European Parliament, making all that noise again. It's not something that they really want, and they really feel that the trust and the relationship has been, been damaged and that it will take a long time to rebuild that, so they'd rather have the UK out. And there is also a group that maybe doesn't really care either way, but I think that is important because here we tend to assume that it's the UK's decision, and if we suddenly choose to uh, have a second referendum or stay in or keep extending, that will not affect the way Europe sees us. And I think we, we need to think about that as well. Thank you. Um, I actually think that Europe will, will have us back with open arms because it, it will have proved, as wanted to go back, that uh, this Europe project is, uh, is, is absolutely working. So, uh, and it would be such a defeat for the Brexiteers. So that would be, well, we'll see. Um, but Florence, uh, you, you spoke with enthusiasm about staying here, but if you look at migration data, uh, what it shows uh, is that um, EU migrants, EU if you want to call them that, EU workers, uh, are not coming here in the same numbers. In fact, uh, net migration from the EU is going down and going down very, very uh, strongly. Uh, people are voting with their feet in a way uh, because they see what they see that there is um, less opportunity here perhaps, the economy here is slowing down, maybe that's one reason, but uh, I think more importantly they don't feel welcome and they're very confused about what type of uh, immigration policy we're going to have in the future. Uh, you, you mentioned that a lot of your French friends don't want to do uh, what you're doing, which is you know, practically become institutionalized British, uh, so, you know, that's what I'm, I'm seeing happening, uh, so you're sticking out, you're sticking it out and saying that uh, this still has huge promises, but I think your friends are not all agreeing with you. you. Tell us a little bit more. Well, as regards the French community in London, yes, many people are leaving, many people have already left, many people are thinking of leaving very soon, but you still have many people coming in as well. Um, you still have a quite dynamic job market in London, um, that's open still to uh, EU nationals. Although I've seen this week job advertisements mentioning not open to EU nationals relocating in the, in the UK. So um, yes, there's already a limit to what the job market is doing. So as regards the number of French nationals in the UK, it's stable. I've checked with the French consulate last week. So. Um, migration and um, immigration. Just, so net, yes, net stable. Net, net stable, yeah. Um, I haven't talked about um, higher education, which is my area of expertise. Of course, Brexit is threatening higher education, which is um, a pity because I'm so lucky I work in higher education. Higher education changes people's lives. And I've seen so many students' lives being completely changed by their stay in the UK. Um, so the impact on higher education is in mainly three areas. Uh, student mobility, the Erasmus project. I don't know if you've heard of the Erasmus project that allows students to move from one place to the other. This is going to be threatened by Brexit, obviously. Uh, and then, of course, in UK universities, you have many EU staff and many professors are, have, have already left, actually, in very famous universities in London. And that causes a problem. Recruitment of academics is becoming a problem here in the UK. And this will have an impact, of course, on quality. Um, and then, of course, it's uh, research funding. Research in the UK is done within universities and the money funding research comes from the EU. It comes from Horizons 2020 or other such schemes. And everybody's very worried about the future of research in the UK. 
um, the UK research has really led in many, many disciplines. So we may question what is going to happen to UK research. Um, so um, another issue is fees, student fees. What's going to happen to EU students? Um, and my understanding is that EU nationals will have to pay the same fees as non-EU nationals, which is three times uh, what UK nationals would pay. Um, and this, of course, will affect migrations and will affect um, students' lives. Because, of course, if you plan to study a bit in the UK and then a bit in another country, uh, and you're faced with uh, £20,000 uh, fees, obviously you're going to make different um, decisions regarding your studies, which is quite regrettable. Uh, well, that's all very worrying, of course. We'll have years of negotiations to, to do in terms of our trade relationship, and, and my expectation is that the Europeans, if we want to call them that, and, and forgive me if I do that, um, have all the cards. So they probably won't agree to have a trade relationship of the type we want, unless we accept people in on same terms as we have now, more or less. So I'm more hopeful about this than perhaps you are, but in the meantime, there will be uncertainty, without any doubt, and I think the universities will, will worry as well. But it's interesting you mentioned the Erasmus Scholarship. As it happens, I have one son who's right now in, in Paris doing his second year of PhD on some sort of interesting exchange. The other one went on an Erasmus Scholarship to Ioannina, of all places. And when he got that scholarship, because he just finished his degree and got that, and he was really excited, and then he came back and said, oh, but the funding is only for six months. So funding has already been reduced for some of those uh, um, things that existed before, which made uh, you know, all our students be really, truly European. And that's a serious, serious problem. OK, I'll, I'll, because they're just all waiting to see what's going to happen. Right, um, I'll open this up. I'm coming to this, this point about um, the EU allowing the UK to postpone its decision as a, as a strategy uh, for accelerating the process of, um, fir fir first of all, um, making the pain bigger than it already is as far as the labor classes. You know, all these manufacturing companies leaving the Japanese and the Germans and so on and so forth. And then on the financial sector, having more people leaving. But my question is, is why are, are in the, the financial sector people, the sponsors of the Conservative Party, more vocal and more influential in trying to say, well, you know, this is senseless. And why, why are people, the working class in labor uh, constituencies that are losing their jobs, uh, saying that we, we want to leave? I mean, this is suicide. People here are very pragmatic. One thing that the, the British are known for, and the Germans are trying to now imitating the parliamentary system of the British. Oh, I mean, this, this is insane. Yes, um, I want to make a couple of points here. Um, I'll, I'll clarify my position first. My wife is Polish, so I'm nothing against European people being here. I welcome them, and I see them as European sovereign nationals. I don't like the fact that the panel here is all pro-Remain. I do think there should be, as in question time, there should be both points of view. It is sailing up in pro Remain. It's completely disgraceful. If you have a democracy, you should have both points of view. I voted against the EU because of governance of the EU. I'm pro-European, but I'm anti-EU. The EU governance, the commission are unelected. And as it comes, the other point I'd like to make is about the, um, the, de the situation with no deal. Legally, we leave on the 29th of March. At the, as we speak, the ERG of the Conservative Party are canvassing people like the Italians and the Poles to not vote in favour of an extension. So if they don't vote for an extension, extension doesn't happen and we leave no deal on the 29th of March. I don't want to be in hock to Brussels and if we leave without a deal, Brussels will put up the border posts in Ireland and if the Irish don't like it, they'll be shooting at Belgian border guards, not British ones. We're not going to put up a border guard regardless. And that's my view. And we'll thank see you. what your response to that is. Okay, one, thank yeah. you very much. One there, yes. Okay, uh, I've been following Brexit and Grexit very carefully, very seriously. And there are similarities which are 
Uh, what I've noticed uh, in the way Brexit is addressed in the UK is that there is an amount of immense ignorance of the other side. They don't know what's happening in Europe. They don't know the procedures. They don't know the instruments. I listened, by the way, I happen to know very well the other side. I've worked for 20 years in the European Commission as a senior official. So when I listen to your politicians in the parliament talking about Europe, the lack of understanding what is the other side, what you should expect from the other side, the thing that you control all the cards. By the way, you control no cards. The other side, all the cards. So at the same time, apart from the lack of knowledge of your politicians, which I deplore, there are some exceptions. I agree. There is a lack of understanding of the average English person, of a kind of insularity. There is not Euroscepticism, it's Europhobia. It's a wrong term, Euroscepticism, it's Europhobia. And uh, um, I believe that sometimes I say, sorry for the British people, that British people are politically immature compared with the Greek squid, politically high mature, high mature. <laughs> the result is the same, by, this, by the way. So what I dread in the discussion is that the no deal possibility is far greater than what politicians discuss. Because anyone who wants to drive to no deal can drive it. If you ask me if I could organize a no deal, I could organize in two days. And not because it depends on the parliament, etc. I would drive the situation where whatever I, whatever I plant in my proposals would be something which would be objectable on the other side. It's not only the 27 countries don't understand the parliament. And the local parliaments, don't forget we have a Brussels parliament to agree. And what could come out from that side, uh, talking about uh, the Spaniards, uh, the, the Greeks might come with, with the Parthenon claims. So you could not expect what could come any time to have a by default and no deal. This is what I dread, the by default, no deal. And then the blame is on the others. We are not to be blamed. So I watch carefully and I keep my fingers crossed. Thank well, thank you. you. Project Fear is alive and kicking, isn't it? <laughs> I think we have to go back to how we came into Europe to realize where, where we are now. Before 1970, we were quite a successful country and politics took over in the form of Ted Heath wanting to make his name as the person that took us into Europe under any conditions. And that's why how we landed up with the agricultural and fisheries policy, which is one of the factors causing people to vote to come out of Europe. And the first speaker talked about uh, democracy and referenda not being part of our constitution. Well, if we had a referendum in, uh, uh, when the Maastricht Treaty was being decided, we wouldn't have got into this situation now because people would have voted not to go into this political situation we're in. We have lost that opportunity and that's why we're in this mess now. The, the no vote, uh, um, no deal vote which uh, happened yesterday does not have any relevance because Theresa May has often pointed out that it's either a deal which is accepted by Parliament after they've asked us to vote on a referendum, or it's a no deal. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that may be the better option because we have the confidence, we are a big enough country to be able to sort our own commercial activities out after we come out, and the EU will be far more flexible in the, the deals which can be made. I think it's, it's awful the way the media have been talking about business all these two and a half years, and it was the people that voted to come out, not because of business, because of 
the freedom of movement, which is, they felt was destroying their part of the world and their jobs. And nobody bothers to ask them in two and a half years. It's been business, business, business. And I think business is strong enough to come up with solutions after we leave, with no deal. We'll touch on those, and I hope everybody can, can say something. But I think there is, a, there is a, a general point to make. Of course, people can have their views, and, and, uh, but this isn't really a debate from that point of view. So we haven't come here to have a, sort of, uh, an argument between us. We, a few people were chosen, brought together, uh, mainly because they have, um, are we partly Greek um, and French? So we come at it from a particular uh, viewpoint. So uh, there are a lot of debates one can go and listen to, and actually the debate happens here in terms of your views. Uh, so, so we didn't come to sort of argue between us. So that's not the, that's not the issue. Uh, but I think a number of the points are incredibly legitimate uh, that, that you're making. And, and you have seen that you know, certainly uh, we have both, you know, we all, you know, we've said uh, how you know, optimistic, in fact, you know, you are about staying here respective of what happens uh, and how open we all think that the UK economy in fact has been to foreigners, to the Greeks who are here. Uh, so it is a place we all want to be in, frankly, irrespective of what happens in the future. So that's a, that's a really positive thing. But in terms of some of the details, you're absolutely right, in terms of the, the, the no deal, uh, you, you, uh, certainly you would need the agreement of everybody to give us an extension and there's no guarantee, as I think Dennis was suggesting, uh, that this would happen and, and uh, as the Nai was saying, quite a lot of people would quite like to get rid of us really, uh, saying that, uh, you know, not that they don't appreciate what, what the UK has done, but because they, they sort of, uh, they, they seize the opportunity, they see this as a great opportunity of perhaps doing something else themselves that the UK was rather good at doing in the past. So it is inevitable that this sort of thing would happen. So no, there's no guarantee. And I think the no deal isn't, is entirely possible. But from our perspective, particularly being foreigners originally, as, a, as, a, as I am, I'm Greek, um, the parliamentary process here has nevertheless confused us and confuses lots of people who look at it from the outside and maybe confusing some of the people in this in this room, and that's why I was asking the very legitimate question as to how can you bring something that's already been voted down a few times back again, and it may indeed end up being voted through. And we may indeed see, see uh, the withdrawal deal through, or we may end up with a no deal. I think everything is possible right now, uh, frankly. Yes, please come back. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This is what I asked. That's why I couldn't. Uh, but but uh, yeah, but it may be changed a little bit by having something added to it. You know, the uh, Cox may bring something. Well, what we're saying, they were saying today on uh, in the political programs was that you're right, um, but that it would still be pretty hard for the speaker to, to do that and defy Theresa May, particularly given that he's already uh, perceived to be very much uh, a Remainer and also has a wife who's Labour, a uh, Labour member or something like that. They were saying he'd find it very difficult, but Dennis may know better. Dennis. Well, I just was looking at the diaries I kept on a daily basis when I was an MP, and John Burko features in them enormously after 1997. The speaker. Uh, now the speaker is a manic anti-European. I write somewhere saying, oh God, another Europe debate, and that Tory trot John Burko is on his feet uh, ranting against Europe. So maybe he's a staunch Remainer now. So look, um, I wouldn't believe everything you read in the papers, honestly. I don't mean that in any rude way. Uh, the Commons is sovereign in its own regard. So if it wants to chew on a bone more than once, it, it, it can. I mean, the Speaker could certainly refuse to take it. He'd be voted out of the chair at that point, and probably rightly so. You know, we're, we're working, you know, I'm not there, trying to work our way uh, uh, through this, and it, it's it's... 
it's it's very it's very 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 difficult. Uh, I'm sorry you feel it should have been a pro and anti Brexit debate. I do tons and tons of those. I did two last week in Portsmouth and uh, near East Grinstead. I think tonight was slightly different. Um, you know, it's like a gathering of Chelsea football fans. So I don't know who Macedonians normally support, and so you don't invite Arsenal to come and sort of uh, explain why they're why they're the greatest team. Um, it's. Um, I do think. Um, oh, by the way, the idea that anybody in Italy or Poland takes the slightest notice of Nigel Farage. Forgive me. Um, I know both countries. I also have a Polish background. I was in Rome talking about Brexit and meeting people two weeks ago. I mean, Mr. Farage. He may be a big name in this country. He has done nothing in the European Parliament. He's never turned up for a single committee he's normally been elected to. He draws the maximum of expenses and allowances and pay. And then if he thinks he can get himself on British TV, he'll stand up and insult somebody. And that's his entire contribution. I like Nigel. He asked me to join UKIP. We always go on very well when we meet. But he has zero influence. UKIP got 1.8% of the vote at the last general election. Their day in the sun is, uh, is, is, is over. Was Britain a successful country before 1970? Well, actually, every major European country had twice the rate of growth we did. I can rattle through the stats if you want. Uh, and that's why we tried to join what was then seen as a, a more successful uh, club. Winston Churchill was the first man to c call for a European Union in the 1930s. In 1938, he called for a unified European army, a European currency, and a European postage stamp. I have to say, I think a European postage stamp would be a really great idea, so we don't have to sort of run around buying different ones in different countries. And Churchill, in 1946, called for the United States of Europe. And in the House of Commons, he said, I look forward to the day when every proud European the Spanish man, the Spaniard, the Dutchman, the Frenchman, the German can say, I am a citizen of my country and a citizen of, U of Europe and a citizen of the world. <laughs> that was Churchill, not some manic Euro-federalist. And really, uh, it's well worth, I've been working on this recently, actually, for a, for a new book. It's extraordinary the extent to which Winston Churchill wrote and said all of the themes about bringing Europe uh, together in a very positive way. The single market, the single biggest transfer of sovereignty in, in our nation's history, when we abolish national vetoes across a range of things, from freedom of movement to the European Court of Justice, that was Mrs. Thatcher's project. That's what she believed in profoundly and fought it through against all the protectionists when I was Europe Minister, you know what they always used to say to me? Why do we give in to Mrs. Thatcher? Why has Britain always been bullying us? Why has Britain been dictating that we've got to open our borders to British banks, British... Why Britain's just an offshore centre for Japanese cars? Why do the Brits make us open our frontiers to British cars, to Japanese cars, instead of French or German or cars made by European people, owned by European companies in Europe itself? The uh, question of the city not being vocal, the first point that was made, I entirely agree. I mean, it is I mean, utter amazement at how craven business has been. They have got under the duvet on June the 24th, 2016, haven't got out from under it since. They're not using their force, but before they did, I mean, it's a city that paid for many of the th uh, American right-wing financial groups that paid for most of the think tanks, Open Europe, the offshore-owned press. I mean, they poured money into supporting sort of Euroscepticism. I don't think they knew Mr. Cameron was going to offer a referendum. I'm not sure, you know, they, they would have voted for that, to be perfectly honest, because this is a disaster now for the city. But they, they don't, they're not going to attack their government. I mean, they all... Yeah, are utterly opposed to the idea of Jeremy Corbyn government. I can't imagine why, but I mean, uh, um, so they're not taking any real action. Trade unions, ditto. It's false consciousness. Uh, why, in the 1950s, you'd 
up at all the a lot of boarding houses of, of the UK, you notice in the windows saying no coloured oh that's Amber Rudd's phrase, isn't it? No coloured, no Irish, dogs welcome. When I started in political life it was Enoch Powell. We've been destroyed by the West Indians, we've been destroyed by the Pakistanis, by the Indians. Now our Pakistani is son of a Pakistani is Home Secretary, another one is Mayor of London. I think they made a wonderful contribution. Uh, when I started life as a football reporter, everybody playing for an English football team was English born or Scott or maybe Derek Dugan or George Best from Northern Ireland. Now, you know, find me an English player in most or more than one or two in most premiership teams. And that's good for us. America is a nation of immigrants. In Switzerland, the richest, most prosperous, best organized country in Europe, I worked there for 15 years, so I know a little bit about it, 26% of the population is foreign born. The number of Europeans in Germany as a share of the population is twice that of the UK. The number of Poles in Ireland is twice the share of the total population as we have in Britain. But the Daily Mail in, 19, in, 1950, in 2008, the Federation of Poles of Great Britain produces a dossier of 58 headlines against Poles in the Daily Mail alone. Front pages, Polish killer, Polish rapist, Polish scrounger, Polish swindler, Polish uh, welfare cheat. When you generate hate against people like Enoch Powell does, and when Nigel Farage says, I can't hear English spoken anymore on rail, and I wouldn't want a Romanian or a Pole moving in next door to me, um, people do feel they perhaps haven't got the jobs they once had, uh, because jobs do move around. I can't recreate the steel and coal mining industry when I, when, you know, when I was a young man. And then you want someone to blame, and the foreigner throughout history has always been the easy person to uh, right. can, blame. Can I just move to perhaps the night, if, if there are any, and, and yourself, Lawrence, if there's anything you want to pick up from what's been asked. Then I have a very, very quick next round. Yes, um, the UK wanted to join the European community at the time from the beginning, uh, 1957, um, because, of course, the benefits were not questionable. And this was vetoed by the French head of state, uh, Charles de Gaulle, because at the time Charles de Gaulle thought that the UK was too close to the US, and for historical reasons he didn't have a great esteem of the US. So when de Gaulle left power in 1968, immediately uh, the UK resumed um, all negotiations to become a member. And the UK did become a member in 1973 and of course um, this is what everybody wanted in the UK. There was then a referendum in 1975 and 62% of the British population voted in favour of joining the European community. Staying. So I think at the time it was the right thing to do. Okay, about the financial sector in the city, do you want to yes, talk about just, that? Um, thank you for your questions, and uh, I think it's, uh, they, they're all very legitimate points. I think on the issue of why people voted uh, this way and why they may have ignored sometimes the economic cost, I think people have the right to prioritize different things, and um, maybe in some cases it wasn't necessarily being against Europe, it was more about a different type of controlling immigration, not necessarily cutting immigration uh, in total, and some people may have thought that the, the price to pay for that was to not have the economic benefits of the single market. We are already seeing the effect of that on the economy. The UK was the fastest growing uh, G7 economy, now is one of the slowest, so it, it is an economic cost that has not been project fear, it is reality. Um, and on the point... No, no, it's higher than, than what some countries. It's, it's higher than some countries at the moment because we appalled 
money into the British economy. We're printing money. We're running huge debt and deficit, which the other Europeans don't do. And when you inject that amount of money into any economy, it will grow a bit faster for the, for the time being. Overall European Union growth, Britain is below it and against most European countries. We are 37th out of 39 total Europe countries, not EU member states, in, in term, at the moment on, on growth. But just one, one final point is that I think um, Dennis also spoke earlier about the fact that Brexit has meant that a lot of other countries now don't want to leave the EU. I would want to hope that the EU also sees this as a, le as a lesson and that um, the reason why countries don't want to leave is not because it's so bloody difficult to leave and that it creates all these internal political uh, fractures, but, but that there are some legitimate issues that the UK campaign has raised and that the EU learns from that and reforms in a direction that means that people want to stay because they actually want to stay and not because it's difficult to leave. And I think this was also a lesson from the Greek crisis as well. That's absolutely true, but uh, it is also true that there is a slowdown in the world economy, there's a slowdown in Europe, you're absolutely right. Uh, Italy is in recession and Germany had one quarter of uh, falling GDP and now it's stagnant. So there are serious issues uh, and it's not, it's not just the UK. Uh, and that is very important for us because of course we tend to uh, unfortunately sell rather a lot of our products to them and of course we're suffering from them. Um, and only by reference to a study that's been done, there, there have been loads and loads of studies on wh why people voted, all sorts of reasons. So it's quite complicated but uh, you know, uh, the austerity has come into it as well. Uh, there is a study now by Warwick, which I was involved in commenting on, uh, only because it's just been produced and I had to go and talk about it, um, which seems to suggest uh, a very strong correlation between austerity and the impact of austerity in, for particular individuals and regions, which then encouraged them first to vote UKIP, and when the referendum came, they then converted that into voting for leave. And the, the, the calculation that they had made, now, it's an, it's an, I'm afraid it's economists and econometricians who have done this, so they've done a correlation, that there is a very strong causality that they have got together, which shows that you know, if that hadn't happened, if those people had not been affected and voted in a certain way to begin with, and then that, uh, that would have meant a 9% swing in the vote in favor of, of uh, Remain. Now, there are probably loads of others who are doing similar calculations trying to prove the opposite, uh, but that is the latest with very, very good evidence that was used. So it looks as if the austerity, and, and so you could look at George Osborne and say, what did he do, why did he do it? And, and you probably know that there was also something called the, the, uh, Im the Immigration Fund, and that was a fund that was going into particular city, uh, regions and cities which had a surge of immigrants, let's say Polish immigrants, and that was in Bolton and elsewhere. Um, not so much to do anything about the jobs, because jobs were plentiful at the time, it seems, but more in terms of access to services, you know, houses, national health, schools, all these sort of things that really irritate a community. If lots of people come and then you know, their children can't get into the schools they want them to. So that's not a very good idea if that, that's what happens. So there was a fund to ease that, so there would be more money spent in those areas. Well, what did he do? He got rid of it two, a year or two years before the referendum uh, vote itself. It's now been re-established up to a point, because a number of these issues are still there, uh, but it's an extraordinary way to, to allow a referendum to happen, even though he didn't really want it himself. He advised Cameron against it, and then do everything around it that, in fact, almost guaranteed that people would vote in a certain way. Of course, there are, as the Knight was saying, loads of other reasons why people voted for that. And indeed, as someone else has said, they're, they, they're, they are, they're, they're like Europe, if you like, but not the EU. And that's perfectly understandable to do. So trying to get some of that out of people with service and so on, it's always a bit difficult, but, because often it's a mix of these things. That, that affects you, but it looks like austerity certainly uh, uh, had, had some influence. Well, firstly, Michel Barnier, David Davis, Boris Johnson, are, uh, I'd count, friends of mine. David Davis certainly, been hill walking with him, Michel Barnier, been a friend, flown with him around the world. They're all three very tough professional politicians. So the idea that David Davis, if I phoned him up and said, hey, David, 
Guys, they think you were a walkover. You were a pussycat that Barnier flicked away with his fingers. Plain fact is, there were no proper negotiations because there was nothing to negotiate. We were leaving. We had we, nothing to do except agree terms on which to leave. Uh, so the idea of a negotiation that might have between two firms that are merging or whatever, or a football club buying a, uh, a player, uh, is, is actually the, ro the, wrong, the wrong metaphor. The negotiations will start as and when we're out, and then it's going to be about 10 years of non-stop, wretched, tetchy, ugly, difficult, with every single lobby and every single producer and interest group in the 27 other countries say, don't give the Brits that, unless they give us this. Uh, what's completely forgotten in all the meetings I've done, nobody's raised it here, and nobody ever raises it. It doesn't matter whether it's a pro and anti-Brexit meeting or you know, with, 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 with people who are unhappy. That is, we're sacrificing so many of our fellow citizens in Europe. We're taking away their rights, and certainly taking away the rights of all of our children to live, love, work, retire without let or hindrance. And I think the 20-odd years of that, that we're more than that, 30, 40 years we've had of that, are fabulous. And I'm so sorry of what's going to happen to our fellow Brits as a result of, of, of this. Um, and, uh, uh, right now, we're seeing a massive... 70,000 net decrease in European citizens going home or not coming, a massive increase in Indian Pakistani people coming to live in Britain. We're swapping you know, Catholic Poles for Muslim Pakistanis. I I've loved my Muslim community when I, was, when I was an MP. I have no problems with them. But you know, I, I don't think we should be saying to the Poles, a pond somewhere in Lincolnshire, Polish anglers not welcome. And the constant chip, chip, chip in the street at people with a foreign accent, you're still here, and the rest of it, I think, is very, very ugly. Art citizens, you're quite right. We're going to lose massively. A small niche industry in London is all the TV shows that you watch in when well, you're on holiday in Europe or in a hotel, you know, Channel 48, there's some American police thriller or some silly show, fills in the time for an hour or so, all of those are sold out of London. It's a 10 million, 10, sorry, 10,000 people work in that industry, it's worth about 2 million. The reason is that if Ofcom, that's our national regulator for television, says this TV show is okay from the point of view of sex, violence, bad language, the three main criteria, then no other European country can block it. You've still got to find a TV station to buy it. It's one of our little niches, like our export of our university education. All of this will go out of the window because every European country will be able to block anything coming out of Britain once we've left fully the, the, the single market. And yes, on the Swiss borders, it just was insane. You had Dominic Raab, Ian Duncan Smith, Bernard Jenkin popping up on Today and Newsnight saying you can go from Switzerland into uh, Daniel Haddam in, into a European country without any check. There are no checks between Switzerland and its European neighbours and that will be how it can work in Ireland. I lived 100 metres from the Swiss-French border because I worked in Geneva, I lived in France. If you take more than a kilo of beef from a French supermarket to Switzerland, it is a crime. Four chickens, it is a crime. I don't know how much wine. They're, they're not checking every tourist car, for heaven's sake. The lorries are checked. You go to the post office and try and send a book to Switzerland. I've got family who live there. They make you fill in one of those funny little customs declarations. I'm sure you've all done it to send to America or, or whatever else. And so, but nobody knew. Nick Robinson didn't know. Evan Davis on Newsnight didn't know. The sheer ignorance of how Europe works, especially on the part of the BBC and Channel 4 and Sky, has been one of the worst aspects of this whole debate. Anybody here from Ireland? Uh, well, any of you heard of a an Irish town called Drogheda. Well, 
Nick Robinson talking to the Cardinal Archbishop, uh, who's a Catholic private, the head of the Catholic Church in Ireland, North and South, uh, said to Mac, what was it? Well, well, Cardinal, of course, uh, you have some very strong memories of what Cromwell did in Drogheda. <laughs> you know, it would be like an, an Irish number one current affairs presenter saying, and then you, you've got problems in your town uh, in the West Country called Walk, Walk Esther. And just the sheer ignorance again and again of the British elites, the media elites, the political elites that don't speak a foreign la European language, they never worked in Europe, they know a lot about America. And that's been one of the most worrying things about this whole debate. On the referendum result itself, every referendum this century on any European question has been lost anywhere. Austerity did play its part, for clear. But you've now got a hate against Europe, William Hague, Ian Duncan Smith, Michael Howard, and many left-wing people as well, and believe me, it's not just a Tory thing, constant sneering, chipping, denigrating Europe. I'm, I'm pro-European, but I hate the EU. It's a bit like saying I'm pro-British, but I hate the monarchy. Remember, there probably are people like that. It's just, it's a package. It's a system of laws that agreed to allow 27 different countries to achieve something they've never... Eight. Uh, 28, to achieve something they've never achieved before. The Poland I went to as a young man to work with Solidarność compared to the Poland of today. The Ireland as a young boy I went to on family holidays with cattle driven through the streets of Drogheda with the Ireland of today. The Greece I went to, first off under the colonels as a student, the Greece of today. This is an astonishing, historic achievement of peace, of prosperity, of coming together. And I hope and pray that there'll be enough courage and common sense in Britain that we don't tear all that up to satisfy Rupert Murdoch uh, or Tommy Robinson. <laughs>